biggest atmosphere in college football is coming to you this Saturday, 7.30, the whiteout. Not only is it the biggest game, maybe not in terms of top team versus top team, but the biggest environment in college football this weekend. It's also the biggest recruiting weekend for football, and the guys who know it the best are here to talk to you about that today. The 2023 whiteout coming up and the recruiting uh, names are pretty stacked. Ryan Snyder, Sean Fitz here to talk about that. Of course, BlueWhiteIllustrated.com is the number one place to get all of the information. We'll give you some of the guys you want to know today on the YouTube show. We'll also talk about Penn State Open Practice yesterday and uh, some news, some movement in the On3 uh, in the On 300 updates for the class of 2024. All of that on today's show. As always, we appreciate your support, your comments. They're always welcome in the chat. We'll be talking to you throughout the show today. So leave your comments and your questions down in the chat. Although if you ask, is X coming or is X committing? You might not get an answer to that one. But uh, if you ask thought-provoking questions, we'll definitely talk about that on the show today. And as always, please like and subscribe. So gentlemen, uh, it's not often that I am out dressed on the show. Sean Fitz looking good today. The haircut, the polo, it's all coming together, sir. Hey, thanks. I'm not even going to bring up that you wore that shirt last night to practice. So anyway, um, yeah, it's it's a big week. It's whiteout <laughs> week. I got I got my white on. I got my on three polo on here and uh, haircut. Went to see Cody yesterday. It was overdue. I got uh, like a pseudo mullet cut last time I got it. And it just I'm 39 years old. My wife's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and the message was received. So back to the regular thing. And I'm, you know, not an attractive man. But here I am uh, on screen and, and looking sharp, I'll say. You, you clean up good, and, and I'll just, uh, in my own defense, I'm a firm believer in uh, conserving water and not making my wife wash too many clothes. So if I don't have to, I'll wear the same shirt twice. And uh, uh, this is another little thing. I don't have an extensive wardrobe. Ryan Snyder here as always. Uh, Ryan, give us the big picture. Start us out with some good news. Penn State football, big recruiting weekend. Um, what you thinking about the list that you've been working on all week long? It's big. Um, <clears throat> well, first off, I feel like it's been like a month since I've been on the show because I missed the last one. So good to be back on. Um, yeah, this is a massive week. Um, right now, our list is at right under 80 prospects. I have 78 players confirmed. I shouldn't say I. Sean's done a lot of work on that as well. So Sean and I have uh, put together 78, uh, have 78 players confirmed so far. I was doing some math uh, before we started here. Uh, Sean, can you guess... Just give me a quick guess. I'm putting you on the spot. I know how many states, how many different states players are coming from this weekend? Give me 17. just a quick guess. What? Did you do the math? <laughs> I did not do the math. I swear it's 17. You, I don't believe you. You did the math. Uh, yeah, 17, uh, which is pretty impressive. I thought oh, we got guys coming from California, down from Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, Tennessee. Uh, of course, Garrett Sexton will be in from Wisconsin. Did some other math as well. Can you guess how many four-star players? Uh, now, this math. is four stars. I, <laughs> I'm okay, done with I'll math. just give it to you guys. 39. <laughs> oh, I was going to guess 40. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> nah. 39. So, and, and that's, and that's look, I, that's not just on three. That's, uh, are you a four-star at 24-7 rivals, wherever it may be? Uh, 39 is the total, including 19, 2025 20, uncommitted four-star prospects. We'll get into that in a little bit. But, uh, yeah, this is a massive weekend. I remember – Man, Sean, it feels like, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, if, if we put, if we got 50 names confirmed, right? Like we were really happy. Like that was, that was an awesome list. And now here we are trying to get to, trying to get to 90. So man, they just keep growing this thing, keeps getting bigger, more popular uh, all across the country, really prospects from all over and uh, should be well over a hundred here on uh, Saturday night. And it doesn't hurt that the, um, you know, Penn State offers a lot of kids now. So that that number is, I don't want to say inflated, but artificially inflated by the number of offers. But it's become such a spectacle. Like it's it's one of those things that you want to tell people that you're at. Um, I will say most of the guys on the list legitimately interested in Penn State. I mean, there are a couple of guys that, you know, will pop up. It's like, hey, this is the biggest atmosphere in college football this weekend. I know Ohio State Notre Dame is going to cut into that list a little bit. But, man, it's it's been fantastic. So. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's really unmatched in terms of like, this is, this is Penn state. This is what Penn state pitches. Like if you want to be a part of it and I know they don't do official visits, I know they're not having a ton of 2024s, uh, the current class, but if you want to be a part of it, this is one of, this is the one in that Holy Trinity that we talk about with the lash bash with the blue white game. So this has 
become a monster onto itself. Um, luckily for Penn State, they've ex expanded the recruiting staff in the past years because I honestly don't know how they get it done with the guys that they have, let alone the guys that they they used to have. So it's been it's been something that has morphed into itself. Of course, the fans a big part of that. The opponent a big part of that. The night game a big part of that, which is why we're talking about this against Iowa instead of Michigan, which is you know set to be a noon kick. So it's um it, it's certainly um, become Penn State's brand, I guess you could say. And, and and really, people have bought into that. Recruits have bought into that. And you look at the roster. James Franklin said it last night. You look at the roster. A lot of these guys that were on or that, that are playing on Saturday attended whiteouts as even freshmen, sophomores, and, and then eventually, you know, when they were probably committed as juniors or seniors. We're going to talk about names from that list today, but maybe – maybe 10% fewer than that, probably in terms of guys that we're going to get to today. So if you want all the information, this is the week to get it. Penn state, they're playing the, in the whiteout. We just described why it's so important, but the big game special, we're giving you access to uh, the elite of the elite in terms of insider information, the big game special right now, blue white illustrated.com going on 50% off your first year of access. So roughly $50, gets you uh, access for an entire year, 365 days of high-octane Penn State football and football recruiting information. If you're watching this show right now, you probably are on the edge teetering towards like, yeah, I'm all in on Penn State being uh, my hobby. It's what I do. It's how I identify myself. Well, guess what? There's a whole group of people that want to embrace you at the Lion's Den message board talking about Penn State football recruiting, giving your thoughts on guys, all that stuff. And of course, the information about who's going to be when, where, how, why. These guys get it for you. Sign up now. 50% off your uh, your first year at bluewhiteillustrated.com for new subscribers. Super excited to see you inside the Lions Den. And I love the fact that we have a ton of people from the live show that started out watching here that are now regulars in the message board. So it is not an uncommon thing for people to come from here and go over there. And we have this conversation uh, with you not just here on the show. So make sure you subscribe, sign up. It's a great week to do it. It's not lasting forever. So that deal going away at the end of the week. I don't know exactly when, so don't don't push it. Also, today's live show is sponsored by My Perfect Franchise. If you are looking to change your life, if you are looking to uh, leave the corporate rat race for the American dream, maybe you want to build a, a side hustle, something to diversify and build wealth, well, My Perfect Franchise is the place for you. Andy Ludicky is a franchise consultant with extensive experience placing people like you within a franchise to manage. So you get to buy into a company that already exists. You don't have to start something from the ground up. You can go in with management and business experience. If that's you, contact Andy, 404-973-9901 or Andy at myperfectfranchise.net. You can see that here on the screen for people listening on the podcast. That's again, 404-973-9901. We've had a bunch of Den members, Lions Den members that have uh, gotten in contact with Andy and have started the process of starting their own business and, and buying into a business. At this time, I know people going into the fall, oh no, is it a recession? Is it not a recession? Even if certain parts of the economy aren't working exactly the way they have been in the past, I learned from him when one one thing falls, another thing rises, and home services right now are super hot. So if you have skills in that area, he can help you find the franchise to manage. So guys, let's get into, before we get to the whiteout, we always talk about open practice on Thursday. Fitz, you were with the defense, I think, again this week. So what did you see from the Nittany Lions as they get ready for the on-field portion of this week's festivities? Shocking preparation as Iowa approaches Happy Valley. Penn State... I think they're going to stack the box um, to, yeah, to deal with <laughs> Iowa's rushing attack. We saw uh, not much in terms of uh, specific personnel, not much in terms of specific schemes, but like you're bringing safeties up this week, and that's not a secret because that's what you have to do when Iowa's in town. Uh, of course, Iowa challenged because they're missing some, um, uh, missing a pair of running backs. Uh, Luke Lachey is a fantastic tight end. They're going to be missing him. So they're going to be hit by the injury bug uh, on the offensive side of the ball. So, Penn State's defense playing confident right now, coming off that five turnover or five takeaway game against Illinois. I think they're going to have an opportunity to turn it up. I mean, they, they always play juiced up in that atmosphere. Um, and as I say that, you know, just first drive, I'm sure I was going to move right down the field. But uh, <laughs> no, beyond that, I think Penn State's going to uh, really have an opportunity to, to have more takeaways. I was going to do what they do 
sit on the ball, try to make this a game into the fourth quarter, and and then some wacky black magic is going to happen if you're Iowa, which it usually does. But but I think Penn State's defense has the ability to not only hold uh, that vaunted Hawkeye offense, but also create turnover. So I'm I'm excited to see what they have in store, what Manny's got in store to uh, to make uh, Cade McNamara hold on to the football. James kind of said this last night when you asked the question about how do you make a quarterback hesitate, and it's uh, it's the man coverage that they play, it's the press man coverage that they play to yeah. try to keep him in the pocket to get their pass rushers after the ball. Penn State's pass rush has been, you know, uh, probably a little bit um, – you know, a little bit lower than we expected coming into this year, but they haven't had a ton of opportunities. Guys have played well up front, but it doesn't show on the stat sheet. And I think that maybe this is the weekend where it can start showing on the stat sheet if Iowa continues to do what they do, run the football, and maybe try and wait for some of those those slower developing uh, passing plays and things like that. So I, I think it's a big opportunity for Penn State's defense. We're going to talk, of course, about Drew and, uh, and the offense of what they're going to have to do against a fantastic Iowa, uh, well-coached, always well-coached um, by Phil Parker defense. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, Penn State's defense is going to have an opportunity to take the ball away this weekend, I think. Yeah, and just watching a little bit of Cade McNamara this year, it's interesting because we're in that portion of the season where it's still pretty matchup dependent. So they've gone against a bunch of teams that play a lot of soft coverages. And it's been interesting, the normally conservative throw the ball to the tight end of the sticks and don't really like push the ball downfield. I don't know if Brian Ferentz is feeling the heat of having to score 23 points a game, but a lot of vertical routes. So you, you look at, you know, what they've done so far, a lot of tight ends down the seam, a lot of attacking down the field, which is why I was just curious about like, what do you do to make that guy hold on the football? Because this could be a week that Penn State sees a lot of sacks because McNamara, not a guy that's going to, Luke, like Luke Altmeyer, uh, throw the ball in those situations. At least that's not what we've seen so far. Just an interesting matchup little tidbit on this. Um, I checked out the offense, as you can see from the highlights here on the screen. Uh, the <laughs> as Fitz is, uh, is just his smiling face is, is, a, is a great yeah. backdrop, to, backdrop to what I'm talking about. Um not a whole lot in terms of what the offense is, uh, you know, from yesterday. It's, um, it, kind of the same thing what you said. There's a lot of the same stuff we get to see each week. I will say one of the things, Mike Yersich is my favorite person to listen to and to watch coach because he's so intense, he's so loud, he's so articulate. And one thing that he said repeatedly, and I don't remember who threw the football, but he said that's exactly what they want. Don't give them that. Tips and overthrows. They want tips and overthrows into this zone defense. So Penn State, not that they don't always, but ultra focus on accuracy, precision, and decision making this week from the quarterbacks and from the receivers. And, you know, lately, I think there's been a certain vibe around the passing attack where they've been pretty positive. It just you you hear like the specific things that they call out and what they're saying. And I've heard a lot of good. That's what we want it. That's how it's supposed to be for the Penn State passing attack when they're going through full passing drills. So um, I, I Fitz, I kind of want to call my shot and say that Drew Aller is going to be able to throw against this zone defense, but it's a very good one. What, what do you think in, in that particular matchup? No, I, I agree. I think that, you know, Penn State's receivers, they, they really missed Trey Wallace last week. And if they can get him back, it's going to change a lot of things. You got to sit in that zone. You've got to find those tight ends sitting in that zone. Um, I, I think when you play a young quarterback that is in his fourth start, you you throw a lot of zone at him and try and make him uh, do the math in his head. And as he's doing the math in his head, he's holding the football. And that's where that's where they're going to be. I would not be shocked if he throws his first pick this weekend. You know, that's a, that's a defense meant to confuse. If you remember Sean Clifford's first start at Iowa, that was – as yeah. deer in the headlights as we've ever seen a quarterback. So, um, you know, eventually he he came and got settled. And I will say this one thing, like Penn State has played Iowa extremely well. Like I know that Iowa's law, won the last two. They won the uh, the COVID matchup and then they won the matchup after Clifford got knocked out. Penn State was, you know, well on their way to a big victory and, until Clifford got knocked out. So I think that they have a handle on the scheme. It's just a matter of processing that, get the young quarterback to do it. And I think playing at home matters. I think playing with uh, with Trey Wallace, if Trey Wallace is out there on Saturday, um, I think that matters. But guys like Malik McNeil, guys like Caden Saunders, we talk about those crossers all the time. It's a yep. little different when you're playing zone, but at the same time, you've got a quarterback that can fit into those windows. And I think he'll have the opportunity to do that. Again, Iowa does some, some really good um, fundamentally structured things, and they do it really well. It's kind of like we talk about that Michigan running attack. It's not the most diverse running attack, but – 
it's effective because they do what they do as well as anybody does it. And that's, that's the Phil Parker defense. So they're going to try and confuse Drew. They're going to try and make him throw it into the windows and they're going to try and make a, a play on the ball very well may do that. Um, but I think that uh, Penn State's going to have an opportunity to, to maybe spread them out a little bit more than they're comfortable in. Yeah, that's that's a major matchup on the other side. Uh, Ryan, before I get to my next question for Fitz, I want to say just do you, do you have any thoughts about the game upcoming in, in terms of like, you know, just your thoughts on what you, you think Penn State can do? I know that we've had our predictions out this morning at bluewhiteillustrated.com. You can check those out. So what was your prediction and what do you think of the upcoming game? So I'm torn. So uh, it depends on these injuries with Iowa. I, I, I think we're going to see more points than that, that over under 40 would lead you to believe, but obviously, you know, they're, they're missing some running backs or top tight end. <laughs> I know no one has faith in, in, in Iowa's offense, but when I watched that Illinois game, I mean, Illinois moved the ball. They gave a lot of gifts to, to Penn state. Right. So I'm really curious to see kind of how they, how they rebound. I mean, to me, I, I think we're looking at like a, maybe a 28, 17, 31, 20, something like that kind of a score. I, I like I wrote in my prediction. I, I think, I think that over under a 40 seems really low to me, which, which is strange uh, because usually when I, when I feel strong about something, I, I end up being totally wrong as we've seen sometimes with best bets in the past, but uh, yeah, we'll see. I, I, I was really interested in that number. So I'm sure it'll end up being, you know, 21, 17, something like that. But I mean, I Penn State should get the win here. Aller's proven uh, that, that, you know, I thought, I thought that West Virginia game was, was really kind of perfect because it was a big game atmosphere, a, a defense yep. that he could, um, didn't pressure, I mean, pressured him a little bit, but didn't, you know, really rattle him or anything. So I feel like he has the confidence he's going to need. Penn State has to get the ground game going. That'll be, that'll be, that'll be massive in this one. And, and then can Penn State's defensive line, uh, you know, keep Iowa's offensive line from, from getting a couple yards down the field and, and getting a push in the run game? That, that's, we talk about that all the time, right? I still think that's, those are the, the, the key things that are going to impact this game, but I do see Penn State winning in the end. So that is that leads perfectly into something I, what I was going to ask Fitz is keeping Drew Aller upright in pass protection is obviously paramount when they throw the football. But I think just watching the film and Hunter Norzad being named the offensive MVP from last week, I don't think people f fully appreciate some of the steps that the Penn State offensive line has taken as a run blocking unit. So Fitz, I'm not asking, are they going to be able to dominate Iowa, but can they play with the strength of the Iowa defense straight up, or are they going to have to find different ways to run the football when those defensive tackles on the interior, they're smart, they're physical, they're strong. Is Penn State going to be able to match up there, or or is there going to have to be some razzle-dazzle in the run game? What do you think? I actually, I do think there's going to have to be some adjustments made, some razzle-dazzle, as you say. I think the tight ends are a big part of it. Like you mentioned last week, the tight end blocking took a step back. There were, there were a couple things in that offense last week you took two steps forward against West Virginia and Delaware, and then you took a step back last week. I think the tight end blocking was there. Of course, the receiver play last week as well. So I think that you're going to have to get creative. And I think what we've seen Penn State be successful with in the past against Iowa is try and find that speed on the edge, try and find Nick Singleton and Katron Allen as receivers, trying to find Tyler Warren getting out in the flat and, and being content with moving the football, not, not necessarily hitting the huge play. So that I think that that's the key there, and that will open it up. Iowa is not a team that sends nine in the box regularly. Like they yeah. play really good complementary defense to the sense that they don't always need to put an eighth guy or an eight, a ninth guy in the box. That's why they always have good safeties. Um, so I think that's something that you maybe have a little bit more room to run as opposed to what you had against Illinois last week. And then you know get away from the uh, oh we got a we got a question there yeah get away from the. Um, square peg into a round hole that we saw last week with running the football. And I think there was a purpose to that in terms of trying to figure out what Penn State was able to do with the guys that they have up front playing a little bit out, man. Um, but at the same time, um, at some point, you're going to have to kick out of that and just do what you need to do well. So I don't think that that's all that uh, uh, scientific of an analysis, but like you're, you're once you kick out of that and you see that you can get outside, you can see that you can get Singleton a little bit more time. And, and Nate made a great point to, uh, on the podcast earlier this week about him being too patient, you get him going, you get him going up field and you've got something to work with. And, and Hey, there's a big difference against seven versus seven guys in the box and eight guys in the box. Um, it's, it, it's very, um, you know, very simple math, but at the same time, it, it's such a big difference when you, when you have to make one guy miss versus when you've got a hat on a hat and you're doing okay. 
Yeah, and you were answering this question perfectly. This is something that, like an auto styling, asked yesterday on uh, the Penn State, uh, the BWI live show, where we, you know, it's a live to tape, and I wanted to make sure we got to that question from yesterday because it, it's it's the question we're we're talking about right now. Is Penn State going to be able to uh, run the football? Are they going to run into eight man boxes? And I think you you answered that one perfectly. But I just wanted to make sure we gave uh, Leg and Auto Styling his credit for asking that question yesterday on the live show. Uh, we got one here from Stephen Light, who's always around. Talk about a regular from the show who's now over on the Lions' den. Fantastic marketing in the whiteout gets them in the door. It's always the first necessary step, getting players interested and and the hype around uh, the show. Um, let's get into the actual whiteout. Let's talk about what's coming up this weekend from the players that you guys want to discuss. We'll talk about a couple, and then we'll get to some other things, and then we'll finish up with the the other players on the list. Uh, do you want to start by class, or do you want to go by headliners, guys? Uh, what's your preference here? Ryan, it's all you. <laughs> I mean, I think there's only one place to start, right? It has to be Bryce Underwood uh, in my eyes. Uh, so we'll, let's start. We'll, let's go headliners. We'll, we'll go Bryce Underwood to start. We'll circle back then maybe on uh, some 2024 guys and, and take it from there. But uh, it's not often that, that Penn State gets the number one recruit in, in the entire country on campus. You know, Underwood did visit Penn State earlier this year. But look, this is going to be an uphill climb. Let's not – I don't want to make it all sunshine and rainbows, right? Uh, but, but look, I mean, he's visited, Penn, he's visited Michigan 10 times, okay? Uh, I think that says a lot. At the same time, this is Penn State's chance to, to make a splash, to make an impression. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about Malik Washington and kind of where he's at. And he's a guy we'll talk about here in a little bit uh, more. But but this is this is Penn State's opportunity because I, I doubt that he gets back on campus at any other point this season. I could see potentially him getting back on campus. I don't even know. I wouldn't say maybe even a junior day, but potentially in the spring. And and then yeah, obviously official visits will come. But will it even last that long is, is kind of the big question here because Michigan seems to have a pretty big edge. Uh you know, when you look at the visits and all that, but there's no denying who the number one recruit in the country is right now, at least certainly the number one quarterback. I mean, Underwood as a freshman, almost 3000 yards, 39 touchdowns, led Bill Belleville to a state championship, did it again as a sophomore last year was, was pretty much identical stats. Uh, he's, he's, he's certainly the cream of the crop right now. So Penn state has a chance to make a splash here. You know, they did a great job with his family when he was on campus in the spring and there's certainly a, a good relationship there. And there is some back and forth. It's just whether, whether you can pull him away from Michigan in my eyes. Yeah. And just to, to underscore how big of a recruit this guy is, he is a five-star plus quarterback in the on three, uh, ranking system, which means he is the number one quarterback and the number, well, not the number one quarterback. Oh no, he is the number one quarterback and and a five star player across every evaluation uh, of him by on three two four seven ESPN and rivals. So, Fitz, this is this is kind of an interesting. I, there's no answer to this question, but I'm just interested in your perspective on the performance of the quarterback for Penn State attracting other five stars. We've talked about this on the show before. Of the next, the best way to get another five star quarterback is to have your current five star quarterback play well. So obviously that's a part of this. How do you think that the management and, and Drew Aller's performances so far have done to put Penn State on the map for for top quarterbacks in the future? Yeah, and we got a, a question in there in the chat about that a little bit ago, and I was kind of like ready to write that off to say is it a make or break for Penn State's quarterback recruiting Aller's season? His season isn't necessarily, but like his career is going to determine kind of how Penn State is seen in that uh, – uh, I guess in that realm of how do you develop quarterbacks? And of mm -hmm. course, you know, it, it, you don't get the opportunity with a five-star every year. Um, for, so to bring him in, it's one reason we talked about to, you know, when, when there was, uh, it seems silly now, but talking about a battle between Bo and Drew, you got to go with the five-star, like, cause that's, that's like your program right there. Um, so I think that that is definitely something to take into account. Like if Drew does well, things will improve. Like things will continue to improve. Um, you look at Ohio State years ago, did not have that quarterback reputation until they did. And then they developed some guys and then it sort of started recruiting itself. Now, I don't know that Penn State's going to get into that situation, but at the same time, there's a real opportunity for them to to build on that. And they've done a nice job with getting Grunkmeyer and evaluating Grunkmeyer, who looks like a stud. Like he he did not look like this guy last year. He looks like a stud this year. It's sometimes it takes a little bit of luck. Aller was the same way. So I think it, it, you develop into that. And I agree with Ryan. I don't think they're going to get Bryce Underwood. Like it, it just doesn't 
really fit with, uh, you know, I guess sort of historical representation in terms of like quarterback pr perspective, Michigan's in there, LSU's in there. He was at Colorado last weekend to check out Dion. Um, so I could see that, you know, being something that, uh, you know, just, just different alignments there, but it certainly can help it for the guy like Malik Washington, who I think is really good. The other yeah. thing to remember here in the 2025 class, of the top 20 um, quarterbacks in the on three industry rankings, eight are already committed. That's a lot. Like I know, I know we talk about, you know, early commitments all the time. That's a lot of quarterbacks because those dominoes usually don't start falling until the winter, until the spring. So this is maybe a situation where you've got a cycle that's a little bit uh, sped up and, and Penn state's going to have to deal with that. And, and Penn state will handle it the way that they always do, which is ongoing evaluations, which is why you find Grunk Meyer in the spring evaluation period. And you're happy to take him. And, and while, while we're not talking about Michael Van Buren right now, like that's the, yeah. that's the beauty of quarterback recruiting is there's no blueprint for it. But at the same time, we've seen a, a lot of guys could, because evaluations are getting better, not only on the coaching side, but also on the, on the, the media, the recruiting service side, but we've seen guys like Caleb Williams go, uh, you know, I guess start to finish is the top guy. We've seen Queen Queen Ewers do that, and then they develop when they get there. And we may be seeing that with Drew Aller as well. So I think that that's a big thing there. But you look at this class uh, of 2025, and I don't want to say the spots are filling up quickly, but Notre Dame just got Deuce Knight the other day, which is a guy that Penn State was was hasn't offered, but they've been talking to. Um, Texas has their guy. Uh, Kelly Smith Jr. is is at uh, Oregon. Ohio State has their guy in Taven St. Clair, which we've already seen a little bit of a ripple effect with Ryan Montgomery in the 2025 yeah. class. So there are schools that Penn State recruits against or should be recruiting against in this realm that already have quarterbacks. And I think that's big. Clemson got Blake Hebert, which saw Blake Hebert, saw Malik Washington. Give me, give me Malik Washington. So Penn State's got an opportunity here to build on what Drew is able to do. And if he's able to put up the numbers and he's able to look like a potential first round pick, it, it's going to have um, this like, like chain of events that uh, where Penn State can all of a sudden recruit quarterbacks. We're going to continue the quarterback conversation in just one second. But uh, if you want to see this five star quarterback, we got a conversation in the chat about Drew Aller and what he has done and hasn't done so far. But See it for yourself. Come to the Penn State football games this year and stay in style. AlumLodge.com. That is where you can go and find the Airbnb for uh, Penn State football fans in Happy Valley. You can stay out in Belfont if you want to stay in the country on a literal horse ranch where you can pet some horses and then hang out and have some, you know, uh, some fireside time and then go to the game on Saturday. Or maybe you want to experience the best of Park Forest, a traditional state college neighborhood live like we do stay in a house of like this is a, how what it's like to live in state college you can find that out or you can go to the brand new areas uh, around penn state the vi the the village at penn state just two miles from beaver stadium they have all kinds of great opportunities for you to stay around town with alumlodge.com you can go check out all of their availabilities. I don't know if they have any for this weekend. You should double check right now. And if you do, alumlodge.com, use the promo code BWI to receive 10% off your booking. That's alumlodge.com. Use promo code BWI to let them know you came from the live show, and uh, you can get 10% off your booking. Call 814-424-3266. Again, it's 814-424-3266 to pre-book listings uh, on the site. And I think they have everything up now, but just double check, call them, and get in direct contact. I personally am a phone call person because you can, it's super easy to ignore things on the internet accidentally. You call people. And they'll they'll answer. And I'm not saying alumlodge doesn't dot com doesn't answer all of their things on the internet, but that's just my personal preference there. The questions in the chat, the conversation in the chat about Drew Aller. Ryan says it's great that Aller hasn't thrown a pick, uh, but you have to live uh, in life. You have to have failure if you want to have great success. I'd like to see Aller, Aller throw slightly more dangerous passes to create big plays. And Mike comes back with this saying there have been no design deep throws. It seems last week, for example, third and seventeen, they run the ball instead of a fifty-fifty ball down the sideline. Why? I think there have been designed passes, guys. Like Fitz, I, I think we've seen this is the the personality development of Drew Aller. Um, I guess what do you see from? Drew Aller and his risk tolerance so far through three games. Yeah, no, I, I think there's something to that. I think he's been told to protect the football. He's done a great job protecting the football. I, I think there have been guys that have been able to, to slip 
deep down the field. It's just a matter of uh, that. That comes with progression. That comes with yeah. picking things up week to week. I mean, it's still a young quarterback. He's still got this grace period that we talk about. So I, I, I think it's there. Um, and I think they have the opportunity to do so. And I also think that they haven't had to. Like, that's the thing. Like, don't put yourself in a position where you're, you know, you say 50 50. That's not always the case. I mean, USB plugs are 50 50, and that's not the case. Like, this is not a situation where you have to press anything because you're, you won by 17 in Illinois. You won by uh, what, 20, 21? No, sorry. I'm, I, I can't do math on the spot. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan disproved me earlier, but uh, <laughs> pretty good at that earlier. I don't know, man. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. That's good true. Guess. You won by 23 against West Virginia, and you won a big game against Delaware. They haven't had themselves in a spot where they have to throw it down the field. Now, you can argue that absolutely you probably should test yourself on that before you have to do it against Ohio state. But at the same time, I don't think they've put themselves in that position in order to protect the young quarterback. So yeah. I'd, I'd like to see it just like you guys. I'd like to see him just how far he can throw the ball. They, they've got to have a guy to do it. Omari Evans who thought they thought might be that guy is, is not playing much right now, if in any, and he's coming back from an injury as according to James Franklin. So, you know, that, I think that sort of changes some things there. Um, you know, Trey Wallace is kind of in that same boat that he does not really, like, uh, you know, he, he hasn't been asked to do that. So Keandre, I think, is probably, would you say that, T. Frank? Keandre is your deep threat right now? Like, yeah, even though he's not the, you know, 4-3 speed guy, um, even though he's pretty fast. Like, actually, he may be a 4-3 guy now that I think about it. But, like, he, he isn't, he's not really shown the traits of, like, a traditional deep guy. But I think he is your deep yeah. guy. Yeah, well, he also plays in the slot, so there's there's a part of that too as well in terms of how you can manufacture deep balls. It's a it's a little different from having to go from the outside than it is from from in the slot. It's entirely doable, but when you think about deep play guys, you usually think about guys lined up on the outside that run that nine route, and that's that's I guess Ryan, where I want to come to you with this conversation about the quarterback and and the flashy plays. Do you need to have all those explosive plays? Do you need to play like Texas? in order to get a, a five-star quarterback or a top quarterback. Because it to me, you look at the passing progressions that Drew Aller has to do, they're NFL level. Like, there, there's sophistication in this passing offense, or at least he's has to, to read a full field. But I see a lot of quarterbacks that just go to, where do I get my stats? Oklahoma. Um, you know, Steve Sarkeesian does a lot of RPOs at Texas. So, um, you know, not that Bryce Underwood and all quarterbacks are the same, but, like, how do you view attracting these elite talent in terms of having to get those explosive plays or just being really good at being a quarterback? couple things. One, how quickly we forget Drew Aller's first touchdown pass of his uh, of the yeah. season <laughs> to Keandre. I mean, that was uh, – no, I get it. Fans want to see more of that, and I think we all do, right? That those, those are those are the fun plays to watch. Uh, two, I, I just think it's all this, – this whole conversation is just too premature. Uh, th th this is the kind of talk that we can have later in the season. We see more stats, obviously – this is the kind. I mean, look to me. How's Penn State going to get more five star quarterbacks? You get it. You get Drew Aller to be a first round draft pick. That that's yeah. how you get more five star. So five star quarterbacks. Obviously, let's see how he progresses this year. Let's see how he progresses next year. But like this, I don't. I personally don't think Drew Aller's season this year is going to have a big impact on the 2025 recruiting board. I think Malik Washington's their guy, and I think it lines up really well to get him potentially. Now, some other guys may emerge. Let's see what happens. But like. This is more of a conversation for 2026, 2027, in my eyes. I don't think a lot of quarterbacks, like when they'll get on campus, you know, they'll break down film and they'll show them those different reads and whatnot. But like for right now, I just think it's all too little premature. I, th I think it just sets a different floor. Like that's the thing for 26, for yeah. 27 and beyond. Of course, you know, if Mike Yersich is here or not, that's going to, you know, have an impact on that as well. Too. But I want to correct myself, Keandre 434 this off season. Um, I was wrong on that and I don't want him to find out because he doesn't like it when, when yeah. Anyway. <laughs> that um, will come up, unfortunately. Yeah. But, but I like the point you made about him being a deep threat out of the slot. Um, you know, just, you can be a deep threat out of the slot, but it's more of a smash fade type deep threat out of the slot yep. than, than anything. So yeah. um, I, I think he's, fully capable of doing it. But anyway, um, but going back to allergy, I think that it just raises the floor for everything else. When you're recruiting quarterbacks, it's not, it, it just puts you in a different conversation with, with guys. And uh, whether that conversation is something that you can turn around with, um, with Bryce Underwood, I don't think so, but like you put yourself in a position 26, 27. And, and that's when you see that kind of slow burn that turns over because all of a sudden like Penn state, I mean, James Franklin, let's be honest not a very good reputation for quarterbacks, even though he's had very productive quarterbacks, but, yeah. and he's put the last three in the NFL and that's, that's something you can hang your hat on. But like you, you look at, you hear nationally, James Franklin, you don't think quarterbacks like that's just, that's kind of a hump that they have to get over. And I think Drew is, is certainly talented enough to sort of crush that theory. I would say he's really good.
Yeah, Absolutely. and James has talked about that a little bit this year in terms of perception and, and the defensive backs and starting a run at that position of being productive and having good guys that go to the NFL and play and building that reputation. And a and quarterback is obviously uh, not the last bastion, but the biggest one of how do you get a run at a certain position. But it's not the only position in football. And for all of the uh, other players we have on the list, like we spent a lot of time talking about Lincoln Washington, Bryce Underwood, and it's an important conversation, but there are other guys here that we need to talk about. So who are the other players that you guys are highlighting? Ryan, I'm going to come back to you that you want to talk about mm -hmm. here on the show to let people know uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. The rest, bluewhiteillustrated.com. I'm going to tell you once again, 50% off to get the full list and what Ryan knows over there. So Ryan, teach up. Yeah. Let's go on some other guys. Yeah. So we're, real quick too, Silas in the chat brings up, you know, recruiting talent is more complex these days with NIL, especially a quarterback, especially a quarterback. I mean, so that's a great point right there. Um, you know, good, good post there, man. Uh, so, all right, let's get into some prospects. Like I said at the top of the show, 78 players confirmed at the moment, 39 four-star prospects coming in, 17 different states, massive list, right? Uh, we're not going to get into all these guys today, but we're talking about quarterbacks. So I do think we need to mention Malik Washington coming back up to Penn State this weekend for Mark Bishop Spalding. Uh, I had a, I went down to watch him play uh, in Matep the other week. Pretty good game. Not, not a perfect game. Kind of started off a little bit slow. Really took command of the uh, of the second half. He throws the pick to Kenny Wilsey, which I'm sure you guys saw there. I, I know it's been eaten out of. I've been talking to his coach about it over the last week or so. Uh, but he's having a pretty good season still. I, I don't want to um, you know put too much stock into, into one interception, one one big moment there that everybody kind of saw. Uh, but look, this is going to be a Penn State, Vatek, Maryland battle. It's shaping up to be that way. And in my eyes, I mean – Vatek has a lot to figure out right now. Maryland, they're always going to kind of be in the mix. His coach, Kyle Schmidt, played for Maryland, played under James Franklin while he was there, by the way. So there's a good relationship there. Uh, this is, this is, in my opinion, Penn State's recruitment to lose. There's a long way to go, more visits to, to take place. And, hey, let's see if any other uh, you know perennial powers come calling and, and more visits come. But right now, I mean, I've, as much as we want to talk about Malik Washington and hype it up and, and, and do all that this week, I still think Malik Washington's the guy that that fans really need to focus on. Uh, Sean, I'll talk about one more and I'll throw it back to you. Uh, I, I want to talk about Marcus Harris too, coming out from from California. I'll I'll, I'll let you talk about Hayes there, Sean. Uh, I think Marcus Harris coming out from Modern Day. Now look, Modern Day's playing St. Francis on Friday night uh, in Baltimore, so that's a big big part of this. Uh, but he did visit previously and had a, and had a very good visit. I, I think right now Penn State could potentially potentially be uh, one of those official visit schools down the road. I mean, we're talking about one of the best wide receivers in the nation, 6'1", 175, a top 50 prospect. Uh, where's he? I think he's been to Texas four times already. Uh, USC, Oregon, Oklahoma have all gotten him on campus multiple times. Uh, but the fact that Penn State now is going to be one of those schools that's gotten him on campus twice, again, with Texas, USC, Oregon, Oklahoma, you're starting to see some of the schools that at least have his interest. Is Penn State going to win, uh, get, get Marcus Harris out of modern day? <laughs> History says it's it's probably unlikely, you know. But the fact that he's coming across the country to play a game, staying back on his own, flying back on his own, then I do think that speaks highly of his interest in Penn State. Let's see if they can set the bar high this weekend. You know, uh, really kind of not to say win over his family, but have a good visit with his family, and maybe that'll lead to an official visit down the road. Yeah, just to, again, just to underscore some of these top players that are going to be at the whiteout game, Marcus Harris, as Ryan described, is a 43rd player in the nation, according to the On3 industry rankings, even higher in the On3 internal rankings, number 32, number six wide receiver in the country. So Fitz, who are the guys you're highlighting um, that are coming this weekend? Before that, uh, Marcus Harris, it kind of sounds like a Nigel Smith situation. This kid visits a lot of schools and shows general, like genuine interest in these schools. And I think he's genuinely interested in Penn State. Distance is going to be tough um, for for a guy like uh, Marcus Harris to end up at Penn State. So I agree with Ryan there. Um, on the flip side, uh, Tyke Hayes, uh, running back from Aliquippa, uh, announced earlier this week that he's going to make his college declaration on Monday, September 25th, coming off of yet another visit to Penn State. Um, I put my pick in for the Nittany Lions. Uh, this is a kid that Penn State's been after for a while. He was the state player of the year in 4A as a freshman, uh, and all, a two-time All-State guy. Um, he's very, very productive. And, uh, I will say this tough to bet against an Aliquippa kid. Those guys, uh, those guys are built, uh, built different. So, um, Hayes is a guy that, uh, you know, we definitely 
while it might not be a situation where it, it pops while he's on campus, I think Penn State should feel really good about where they where they sit right now. Um, I think the same can be said for Brady O'Hara, um, who's coming back for yet another visit this weekend. Um, listed as a tight end, uh, there was something out there on Twitter last week where it mentioned that Penn State's recruiting him as an offensive tackle. This is something we've talked about for a while, actually, with O'Hara. Um, he's a really, really good, I guess you could call him a jumbo athlete. Like, um, is he good enough to play tight end at Penn state? I'm, I have questions about that, but is he big enough and athletic enough to be an offensive lineman at Penn state? I think he is. So interested to see where that development takes place in the next couple of years. But Brady O'Hara, uh, Penn state is the overwhelming leader on the on three, uh, recruiting prediction machine. And I think for good reason there. Um, and I think, uh, those two guys, if you're looking at guys that, you know, potentially could join the class and still very early in 2025, we kind of lose sight of this with, with guys committing all over the place, but very early in 2025, still in September in 2025, usually you get to see those, that, that kind of movement, maybe a little bit later in the, in the season. But those are two guys that you just highlight and you think that, probably just a matter of time until they're Nittany Lions. So interesting to watch those guys come about. Um, you know, I know Ryan has been in touch with Trent Wilson, the defensive lineman from Maryland, was at St. Francis, now is at Wise. I think that's a big move, especially with Penn State's luck at St. Francis. Uh, pretty much you know, all time, you know, <laughs> I was going to say in recent years, but <laughs> just ever. Um, but uh, he's a really, really good defensive prospect. And it's going to be his second visit to Penn State in September. Um, it's, uh, it, it's one of those winnable recruitments in Maryland. And again, I think him going to wise is, uh, it's certainly a good thing for Penn state. For sure. Ryan, for sure. Go ahead. T Frank. No, I was just setting you up to continue the conversation. I just butted in yeah. accidentally. <laughs> well, we have to talk about two 2024 guys. I'll save them for last though. Cause I did, I did skip those guys. So I apologize, but I do want to also talk about Brett Clatterball. Uh, T Frank, I don't know if you cut his highlights or not, but this don't is, have them, and when you talk, when you talk, it's fine. When you talk about a middle linebacker who fits Penn State, I think Brett Clatterball is like this is what Penn State fans think of, right? Six uh, two, two twenty, right now, uh, out of Culpeper, Virginia, plays at Eastern View, uh, top. Right now, he's only a three star on three. I think there's a real chance that changes. He's a four star at every other site, uh, number two fifty nine in the consensus ratings. Uh, so the thing with Clatterball that's intriguing to me is he picks up an offer in June, 2022 returns for last year's whiteout game and hasn't been on campus since. And I think when you look at that from the outside, looking in, you look at the fact that he's visited Georgia multiple times, South Carolina, multiple times, uh, who else I missed Va tech a couple times. And it looks like uh, his interest faded there. Like what's going on. I, I did a story uh, or I did some research, I guess on him last week when we confirmed that he was visiting and, and the feedback couldn't be any different, really. It, it was more so uh, that his family really actually seems to really like Penn State. They came early. They understand what Penn State is. And now they were kind of trying to go out and find schools that compare to Penn State. So obviously getting him back on campus is big this weekend. The two visits to Georgia since June have my interest. He was just at a game in, a week or two ago. Uh, also, like I said, went to Athens in June. So keep an eye on the Bulldogs there. Obviously, they're 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 the, the program right now. So let's see how hard they push, but this is a player. I think Penn state should be able to get an official visit from down the road should very much be in the mix with. And uh, you know, there's a lot of talented linebackers for 2025. It's, it's pretty, <laughs> the, the board's just kind of, whenever I think I haven't figured out it, it, it I, I have somebody else telling me something different here, but as far as a true Mike for 2025, I mean, I feel like this has to be one of their top one or two guys. Uh, any other names? We're deep into the show. We still got to talk about the on three recruiting update, but I want to make sure if there's anybody else we want to talk about. You you said a couple 2024 guys, uh, 26 Tyler Merrill, Maxwell Riley. What's the fits? What's the what's the barometer of a 2026 offensive lineman? Phil Troutwine has had success of getting guys very early in the process, but um, those two guys, I think, especially Merrill with his size, fans are probably pretty excited about that. Those are two different situations kind of flipped on their head because Merrill, of course, the Pennsylvania kid at Cumberland Valley, like there, there's an opportunity for him to, to know Penn State, to grow up with Penn State. Um, and on the flip side, you've got Maxwell Riley in Ohio growing up with Ohio State. You know, like it, it, these are different situations where you can continue to press with Tyler Merrill to continue to maybe I don't want to say build an elite. I, I know Ryan's closer with him, but, you know, build on what you've started with him versus Maxwell Riley, who, if you're born in Ohio, Ohio State has the lead from from that point on. So, yeah. um, so you got to kind of flip that one on its head. But uh, yeah, it's an opportunity for them. It's an opportunity for Penn State to just sort of. It's not a first impression, but it is a lasting first impression, if that makes sense for these 2026 kids. 
Um, hopefully not many of them are ready to make a decision. I know Messiah Mickens is already on board in 2026, but like, this is one of those things that's going to stick for a while. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of setting them up for next, next year. And, it, and it's a big group. I, I know I mentioned Penn state offers kids earlier and earlier this year, but this is a big group of talent. Um, you know, you look at Dia Bell, the son of Raja Bell quarterback coming up from Florida, his second visit of this calendar year, Colson Gatton, who's Aaron Gatton's kid, uh, who played at Penn state. I mean, you've got, uh, like, if you look at this 2026 list, maybe not as good as the 2025 list, but not far off. And that's, uh, that's saying something because it's yeah. a really good 2025 list. I will say for our guy, Steven, who's asking about wide receivers, there are a couple here that, that catch my eye. Lex Cyrus um, from Susquehanna Township. Uh, I know he's again, close with Ryan, Ryan, since he moved to Harrisburg, all the Harrisburg guys love Ryan. So that's kind of where we're at with, uh, with Lex Cyrus. <laughs> he's got legitimate speed and he was at camp and he's a, like, I thought he was a track guy. Uh, he's a football player. Like he was, he was really good at camp. Um, and then down the list a little bit, Quincy Porter uh, from North Jersey uh, just confirmed with us this week. I think he's really good. Um, so there's there are names that are popping up in 2025 that I think there's you know there's guys with that little check mark beside their name with offers, and then there's guys that I think can be like legitimate players here. Those are two that I think can can be legitimate players at Penn State. There's there's so much we could talk about with this group. Um, we do need to get on to the the next set of no, names. But no, 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 final, no, no, no. No, I I'm setting you up for no. it, Ryan. I'm okay, setting you up ahead. for it. Go ahead. We have to talk about Jalen Harvey. If he commits yes, this you. weekend okay. during the whiteout game, I'm just going to start drinking because that's going to be too many things at once. But we have to talk about him coming up for this game as well. Right, Ryan? Yeah, I thought we were just giving the one 300. I apologize, buddy. Uh, yeah, because I, I, we should have talked about them at the top. And uh, I got excited looking at this 2025 list and started going. But look, there's two there's two guys here that we really need to talk about. Jalen Harvey, of course, is one of them. Uh, four star in the in the industry rating uh, out of Quince Orchard, 6'2", 250. We've talked, I mean, I think anyone who's been watching this podcast for at least a couple of months now uh, should know all about Jalen Harvey and, and you know, how important of a player he is to Penn State moving forward. He's, he's certainly one of their top uh, remaining defensive end prospects in this class. And when you look at the other guys who are available and who they're looking at, there, there seems to be quite a bit of a, a, not a huge fall off, but there's certainly some sort of fall off. So uh, when is he going to commit? It feels like USC, Penn State to me, Maryland's in the mix, and it just feels like he's pretty torn there. I mean, USC certainly requires recruiting him really hard. I wonder how much NIL is coming into play with that. I think there's certainly some of that there. Uh, but this is also one of those ones, <laughs> like I wrote this yesterday, like if if you would tell me at signing day that Jalen Harvey made a random commitment during the whiteout game, I, I would look back and say, yeah, like it wouldn't shock me, right? It, it should have seen it coming maybe. <laughs> but like it's it's just, it's it's kind of just totally up in the air with this one. He's He's been very quiet. He's open about, you know, when he visits and things like that. But Truly what he's thinking, I don't really believe any of us truly have a, a great feel for when he's going to decide. I mean, he's put out multiple commitment dates now, kind of keeps pushing it back, says he's going to visit Maryland later this year. We'll see if that happens or not. But uh, Penn State needs needs Jalen Harvey. They need to wrap this recruitment up. And I, I will say, even if he were to make a commitment this week, like, is it really going to be wrapped up? I, I'm not exactly sure. Every, everybody, Sean Space <laughs> says it all. Um, just everybody, everybody I talk to is like, they, they, they fully expect this to go to the distance. So yeah. we'll we'll see um, how that plays out. we got to mention Ernest Willer as well. Uh, back home now, uh, we've talked about Ernest, I think, once or twice in the pod recently, but he he has confirmed he'll be uh, coming to town for the whiteout game this week. And I think it's his first visit in nearly a year, I want to say. I don't have the uh, – what was – oh, yeah, no, actually, he was at the um, whiteout game last year. So, yeah, the 11 months or so. Right now we have him at 6'3", 250, but that, I don't think that's a very accurate measurement. So let's see – I know a big thing Penn State wants to see is kind of where he's at right now. Looks like he's lost some weight. Uh, we have him as a, an interior guy listing him there. Uh, is that truly where where he's going to be long term? We'll see. Um, Sean, I know you've been digging on this too. I, I kind of want to throw Ernest to you a little bit, Sean, too, because you, you seem to have a better uh, feel for what Penn State's thinking there. I, I wish I knew, really, um, because this is a situation <laughs> where he was on the on the board very early, went down to IMGs back at Concordia Prep and playing. Um it's not often where you see a prospect ranked as highly as he is or, you know, with with as many of those check marks as he has. And no schools have hosted him for official visits this summer. That is like scratch that head there um, to see what happens um, with him. So I'm curious to see where this one goes. He does not seem to be in much of a hurry at all. His visit this weekend is an unofficial uh, of the unofficial variety. Um, 
I believe you went to Maryland also um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Virginia Tech is a school that's in the mix as well. Just a, a very mysterious recruitment, not in the sense that it's like, you know, that he's driving this or anything like that. But you talk to a lot of people, whether it's, uh, you know, what we do, whether it's in in the the coaching profession. And it's it, there's a there's a shroud of mystery there. And that's really interesting because it does not happen like that anymore, especially for a kid that was at IMG for so long and it's been on the national radar for so long. So uh, I wish I had more to, to give you there, Ryan, but uh, this one is, is definitely, it's, it's been the head, probably the head scratcher of the 2024 cycle. We'll move on. And uh, as we learn more information, blue, white illustrated.com is Jalen Harvey going to commit when he's going to commit Ernest Willer. What's the situation there? We give you what we have now, but blue, white illustrated.com is where you get all the information as it develops. Sign up right now for 50% off our yearly price. And I'm just going to throw this up here one more time because I'm very proud of this graphic. And also because it gives you the information, new subscribers. If you want to join us, it is well worth your time. One of the things that we got to this week, Ryan, I'm going to throw this to you because this was, this is a, a right up your alley of the on three rankings update. And the Nittany Lions got a lot of good news uh, this week, I think. So tell us what we saw from uh, the rankings update. Yeah, not, not a whole lot of changes, especially compared to what we saw uh, in July. Right. Um, But the Penn State still has four guys in the top 100. That's important. I think the biggest takeaway was certainly Cooper Cousins being where Cooper Cousins, we, Sean and I have both thought for a while, especially Sean. I give Sean credit on that one. He's been beating that drum longer than I have. I I'd certainly always thought Cooper Cousins should be an on 300, on, on 300 guy. He actually fell out of the on 300 at one point. He was always a four star, but fell just out of it. Now he's up to number 129. Uh, nationally as you guys see there on the graphic he moved up 85 spots in this most recent rating and the one before that i believe was in the 50s or 60s i want to say so he's made just a just a massive jump here and and i think it's fully uh, earned i mean charles has written about it i think once or twice now about his early season film his uh uh, versatility, I guess, being a center and his size and how he could uh, potentially be moved around in years to come. So uh, I, I fully expect Cooper Cousins to should stay in that top 150 now, uh, maybe even move higher. We'll, we'll see long term. But Grunkmeyer moved up 38 spots as well. Uh, not too many guys moving down. Torrey moved down 30 spots. Everybody else is just kind of like a handful of spots there. Uh, but you got Garrett Sexton, Malachi Williams, Liam Andrews, Luke Reynolds, all still in the top 100. 11 guys in the 1 300 overall. Um, any, anybody we're missing, Sean? I mean, who, who's the guy that should be in the 1 300 that's not? I guess I would say Belgrave Shorter. Is that kind of, he's the guy who pops in my head at least. Depends if you read my piece from two year yesterday, but apparently not. Uh, no, Belgrave Shorter is. Well, that's yeah. good. At least we agreed on that, though. I did. No, Belgrave Shorter is my guy. Like he's uh, he's really good. Um, he's having a good senior season. It's tough because he plays for that Mandarin defense, which of course has John Mitchell on the other side. Uh, they got a four star safety in twenty twenty five back there. They've got Jamie French, who is fantastic as a like. There's so much talent on the team that you kind of don't get a full scope of how good those guys are. Now they're playing competitive games. They're playing a really good schedule. Um, but he's he's stood out and he's been a guy that's made plays. And I think I'm a big fan of John Mitchell. Belgrave Shorter might be more ready to go. Um, so I'm curious to see where that more goes. Physical, Popped up in Florida sure. last weekend. So Florida's uh, obviously still on him. Um, but uh, I think Belgrade Shorter is a guy that uh, I think is I, I don't want to I hate to throw the U word out there and say he's underrated. Um, because, you know, I think our guys do a really good job. But I think if, if there's a guy I'm looking at in this class and saying, I can see him a little bit higher, it would be there. Um, I'm also curious to see where Tysir Denmark ends up. Like, from a pure talent perspective, I think he's an on 300 guy. Like, I don't know that he has the pure speed um, that you that we necessarily thought that he had as a younger prospect. Um, he's yep. got the quicks. He's got the, the hands. He's got a lot of abilities that make him a very exciting slot receiver prospect. But at the same time, like he's, um, you know, he's uh, he, he's I think he's been held up by, by a few things. So I will yeah. say that I think he's got the talent to be in there. And if he continues to produce like he's produced it so far are producing so far at Imitep this season. I think he's got the, an opportunity to, to jump back in, but we will see how he handles, uh, you know, as the competition gets stiffer throughout the year. Yeah, if you're an undersized receiver at 5'10", and you don't have elite speed, I know just talking to Charles and knowing how he views this stuff, that's it's hard to be very highly ranked if you don't have those NFL-style measurables. Um, very big into that to project 
who are the next guys, uh, you know, not just the next level, but but beyond there as well. Um, another guy I wanted to ask you about is Egan Boyer in terms of where where he is here. I think he's a three star prospect. These, of course, are the uh, these are the industry rankings you're seeing here on the screen. Uh, Ryan, how have you any feedback so far on Egan Boyer and his development over the summer? I mean, his his camp performance was. I mean, uh, testing wise was up there with anybody this year. So I, I haven't, I'll be honest. I haven't been able to really watch his film a whole lot or, or get information on how his early season has been going. But you know, when I've talked to people, when I've talked to, you know, sources, whatnot, they have Egan up there with Cooper and with Sexton as far as long, long, long-term potential goes. So let's see. And Donovan Harvard too. And I, I mean, of course, Caleb Brewer too. I don't want to leave those guys out, but like as far as true tackles and all that go, but, um, yeah. but no, I mean, Egan's certainly a guy that I've felt like is kind of uh, being slept on a little bit. Charles did move him in. He is an 89 now. He was a bit lower when he committed. Uh, so he is moving up in the, in the ratings, but um, I got to, I got to see his early season film before I could really open up about that. I guess, um, I guess you would say. It's it's not there. I've checked many times, and okay. I, there's like one clip, and that's basically it. And I, that that's the reason I actually kept him out of my piece yesterday is because I want to see how he handles things. Of course, he's coming off the uh, the off season surgery and and things like that, but there's just no tape out there yet. Yeah, I, I just a side note too, like uh, New England getting started a little bit later. Liam Andrews, Luke Reynolds, they just got started recently in their 2023 season. So I, I don't know that that would change because both those guys are top players. You saw them on the rankings graphic, but just a, another side note there in terms of we've seen a lot of Ethan Grunkmeyer. He has moved. He has been doing a lot because Ohio gets started early, and I guess that's what we started with quarterbacks. And I'm going to end with a question about quarterbacks. Here is uh, there are people that think he can potentially be a five star that I've I've spoken to do you guys think that that door is open and just generally where he is right now do you think he's going to kind of hold in in the middle 150s 130 somewhere in there as the season goes and we get closer to signing day or do you think there's more upward mobility uh Ryan I want to get your thoughts on and fits we'll, we'll at number 137 in September no no I, I don't think that I mean that would take a massive move I mean from a I mean, his, his mechanics are excellent. Um, but I just think like, I, I'm, this is, this is nothing to do with Ethan. Rockmar. I'm just looking at where he ranks right now and what's left. And we're deep into this cycle. Right. I mean, th that would be, when's the last time you saw a quarterback go from 137 to top 30, Sean? I mean, I can't, I can't think of the last time I've seen that. Drew, but anyway, <laughs> no, <laughs> that, I mean, was a, that was, that was, that I, was in, that was in the summer. You know what I'm saying? That, that was in spring into it June. Was that wasn't it, in so. September. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I had to take it. Yeah, but no, I I agree, and I think like size is going to come into play there. Like he's he's six two and skinny, like, and he will definitely get bigger at the college level. But like he's not the six four six five like prototype. And I know that some of these guys in the top ten are smaller guys. Julian Sands number one, and he's six one and a half. Like he's um, different in terms of an athlete. But I, I just. I, I have a tough time seeing him hop those guys. He will play in the Under Armour game, which is, I think, not important, but we're going to get to see him with his peers. And I think that that's mm -hmm. the important thing is not so much, you know, how he, you know, how he does in the game. It's how does he look next to his peers? Did a really good job at the Elite 11. We're going to see how he does it in pads in, uh, in, in Orlando in January. And it's not a be all end all, but it's another data point. And I think it's been a data point over the years where you can glean some things from some of those guys that have gone down there with big reputations and not delivered. And it's, it showed in their college careers. Then you have guys that go down there and, and do really well and, and it translates to the next level. So I don't know how it's going to go for Ethan, but I'm, I'm excited to watch it. And that's my pitch to go to Orlando and Florida in uh, late December. Oh, you buddy. Hey, one thing, <laughs> hey, real quick. I mean, he is yeah, the 10th yeah. ranked quarterback in the country right now, which is really good. I mean, let's think about yes. Penn state. We're quarterback recruiting, over the years, right? I mean, they they got Aller. Now they got uh, now they got Gronk as a top ten guy. I mean, they they they're they're doing just fine there. I, I think Gronk's going to certainly be somebody who plays a good bit here. It's just hard for me to see him jump in DJ Lagway, a Dylan Riola, I mean, Luke. Ironically, Luke Gronkmeyer's now up there as a guy. Oh, you know, no. Sean yeah. Sean was beating that drum really early as far as where he ranked on Penn State's board, and now he's a, a five star guy, right up there at least. So um, yeah, it's just gonna be hard to make that jump at, with only I think there's only two more rating updates to go. I believe, yeah. maybe three. Well, that's what I got for today. I think we had an excellent show. Thanks to everybody who uh, was uh, participating in the chat. We'll be back tomorrow for our Friday Five Things previewing the game. And then, of course, 
4.30 on Saturday, the BWI Live tailgate show, uh, Penn State football tailgate show put on conjunction with uh, Seven Mountains Media. We're going to be taking you through the game for 90 minutes heading into the official tailgate show for Penn State football. All of that stuff this weekend. Guys, I'll give you the, the open mic for the last thing that you want to promote for the site. Uh, Fitz, 50% off. People can get it some premium content, some premium information. Just a preview of something that you're thinking about for the next couple of days leading into the game to whet the appetite for what's next. Yeah, I mean, it's whiteout week, and that kind of speaks for itself on there. I think that our staff does an amazing job covering Penn State better than anybody, and it's uh, it's I think it's worth worth a try. Like, give us a shot here, and, and it will be I think you'll be happy with with what you did, especially if you're viewing this uh, live or viewing this on a tape delay. You're that kind of Penn State fan that we target and that we work for that kind of Penn State fan. So uh, hopefully that's something you can get. I mean, we're still confirmed. I just added somebody to the thread in terms of a four star that confirmed uh, while we we're on on the show here. So that stuff is not stopping. And then, of course, after that, the reactions and everything, it's always, always very popular. So um, I think it's I think it's going to be a ride. And I think uh, it's one you want to be a part of. You're going to love it. Join blue at illustrated.com. We will be back tomorrow. We'll talk to you then.